Bergen, founded in the 11th century to control the fish trade along the entire Norwegian coast, became the capital of a vast kingdom that stretched from Ireland to Greenland and included the Shetlands, the Faroe Islands, and Iceland. In 1350, the city came under German domination. The merchants of the Hanseatic League set up their warehouses in the Brigand district, which at the time was right on the port. Rebuilt after the fire of 1702, Brigand's houses with their brightly colored wood facades are now listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The houses have become the showcase of Bergen, the cultural capital of Norway. Gateway to the fjords, Bergen is undoubtedly the city that best represents the ties forged over the centuries between this country and the sea. A unique fact in maritime history, the ships of the Hertegruten Company have been providing passenger and cargo service along the Norwegian coastline continuously, 365 days a year, since 1893. We leave Bergen on board one of these coastal express ships. Our voyage will take us to Kirkenes, 2,500 kilometers north on the Russian border. Sailing along the coast, in and out of the most secret fjords, we are about to discover Norway viewed from the sea. During the night, the boat stops several times in small ports to the north of Bergen. We're headed for our first destination, Alessund. In the beginning, in 1893, the Hertigruten boats ran from Trondheim up to Tromsø and Hammerfest. Later, the line was extended. It now goes from Bergen to Kirkenes. We call at 34 ports. The boats sail from Bergen and the round trip from Bergen to Kirkenes and back to Bergen covers about 2,500 nautical miles. That's almost 5,000 kilometers. Now the Hurtigruden company is moving more and more toward tourism, but we still provide service for the local population. People take the boat to go to the hospital or to do shopping in town. They use it to visit family and friends. And we have another important job, delivering the mail to the coastal region, especially to the northernmost region of Norway. The road from Bergen to Alessund is long and interrupted by fjords that have to be crossed by ferries. 
So sometimes the Norwegians prefer to take the coastal express and load their cars directly on the boat. The passengers, who are mostly tourists, have a few hours stopover to visit the lovely town of Alisund. This fishing port is one of the busiest in Norway. From here, trawlers sail up to the north to the Barents Sea, and sometimes as far as Greenland. But what gives the town its charm is its architecture. In the old days, as everywhere in Norway, houses and warehouses were built of wood. In 1904, a huge fire ravaged the city. Harald, who has a passion for his city's history, tells us what happened after that. The Art Nouveau style spread through Europe from around 1895 to 1910. That was the richest period for Art Nouveau. And right in the middle of that period, Alison burned down. Fifty architects descended on the city to work on its reconstruction. They had been trained in Germany, Scotland, England, France, in Belgium, etc. They came with their ideas and put them into practice here. That's what explains this particular style of Art Nouveau. But what distinguishes Alessund are the corner turrets, the use of rough stone, and the friezes on the facades. And what is exceptional is the uniformity of style in entire districts. There are many European cities with much more beautiful buildings, but what's remarkable here is that there are so many of them. The extent of Art Nouveau architecture here is really impressive. The passengers are back on board. The holds are loaded, so the Nordlis casts off and continues its voyage towards one of Norway's most beautiful landscapes, the Geranger Fjord. We sail up the fjord for several hours, traveling more than 100 kilometers inland. These ancient glacial valleys invaded by the sea have become the symbol of Norwegian landscape and nature. The Geranger Fjord with its seven sisters, the most famous of the many waterfalls that cascade down from the mountain peaks, is one of the Norway's most frequently visited sites. During the 19th century, the King of England, the Emperor of Germany, and many other crowned heads would drop anchor every summer at the little village of Gehanger, nestled in the depth of the valley. What you see here all around us is um, uh, protected landscape areas. So that means that it is um, not allowed to do any 
huge buildings or new development in the protected landscape area. Uh, and that gives us um, um, a belief that we can do uh, preserve our nature values for also for future generation. But at the same time, we also need development. Uh, we do not want to be a historical museum or just to preserve it uh, in the way we have today. We need development. We need also to create new working places, to create new industries and, uh, and businesses. So we need to look upon how can we do that with taking care of our, our World Heritage Site. When tourism started for over 100 years ago, uh, there were only farmers here. And um, the farmers were, were quite poor as well. And uh, when the first cruise ship or first cruise liner came into the fjord, uh, the farmers um, uh, discovered that they could earn money on the tourism, tourists or the visitors coming in. So they started actually uh, with transporting the tourism uh, up the, high, the mountains uh, to show them the view and to show them the beautiful nature landscape. And it started with horses um, and it continued with uh, old automobiles, uh, veteran uh, automobiles. And today we have buses transporting tourism in the same way, really, uh, showing visitors tourism, the spectacular natural landscapes which the, the glaciers has created here in Norway. The Nordlis turns around and heads back down the fjord towards the ocean. Through the night, we continue north toward Trondheim, a town protected from the ocean swell by the many islands stretching along the coast. As we approach Trondheim, we pass another Hurtigruten ship, probably on its return journey from Kirkenes to Bergen. United Norway's first capital, Trondheim, was for a long time the port of departure for the Viking expeditions to the lands of the far north. Trondheim is the religious capital of Norway. The huge Gothic cathedral of Nidaros, which was also the town's name in the Middle Ages, is a reminder that in those days, the jurisdiction of the archbishopric extended as far as Iceland and Greenland. When the King of Norway visits Trondheim, he stays in this palace, the largest wooden building in all of Scandinavia.
The colorful warehouses that line the river are, with those of Bergen, a prime example of wooden architecture. Fire, water, frost are so many enemies that those trying to preserve these buildings have to fight. These warehouses are the remains and the memories of the city harbor, built for storing goods going out and in uh, to the city and still preserved. Several uh, dozens of them, I think three dozens of the real old ones from the 1700s and early 1800s, built mostly in timber, that's uh, this tight construction of log wood, very special for Norwegian architecture. All through the following day, we continue our journey northward towards Svalvaer in the Lofoten Islands. In the morning, we cross the Arctic Circle. 66 degrees, 33 minutes, north latitude. This boat is the MS Lofoten. It was built in an Oslo shipyard in 1964. It's the only traditional boat left. It doesn't have all the comforts of the new boats, but there are passengers who will travel only on the Lofoten. Yeah, 
Whenever we pass another company boat going in the opposite direction, we always greet each other like that. We're approaching Baudu. This little port is usually very busy, for Baudu is situated right across from the Lofoten Islands. Many Norwegians take Hurtegruten boats just to cross to Svolvaer, the port of the Lofotens. It's also the opportunity to deliver a wide variety of goods. Train stops in Buda. It's not a not, uh, train of, uh, north of Buda, so. So uh, it's much color from Buda and uh, far, far north. Since leaving Bergen, we've made about 15 stops. From now on, the Nordlis will sail due west towards the Lofoten Islands. At Svolvaer, we'll leave the Nordlis. In a few days, we'll board another Hurtigruten boat at a different Lofoten port to continue our voyage. Uh, Lo is the Swedish or old Norwegian word for lynx and foten means foot. So if you look on the map it looks like a lynx foot going out in the, in the ocean. But Lo also means the windshade, like Lee and Lo. So it could be the foot that protects the fishermen from the bad weather from, from the ocean. But we don't, really don't know what Lo foten means. The shape of, of the islands is due to the Ice Age, particularly the, the last one, only 12,000 12, years ago. And in between us and the mainland, there's a fjord, the West Fjord, and we have the Gulf Current, which also at that time was warm. So this, the snow cap or the ice cap that covered central Scandinavia just melted on the way out. And it was only three to 500 meters thick when it came out here. And through that, we have the, the, the nice rounded valleys you see in the back here and the peak sticking out of the ice, which was Nunatak. And that is how Lofoten is, is like it is today. And it's actually just like a chop off of the Alps and drop it into the ocean. That is Lofoten. We board a little excursion boat to visit Trollfjord, one of Norway's narrowest and wildest fjords.
middle of the fjord, we meet up with another Hurtigruten boat to take on other passengers. Later in the day, we take part in a rather surprising fishing party. Like this? Yeah. Then it's very important that you have your thumb on the line, yeah. otherwise it goes down too fast. Yes. On the way down, you stop the pole yeah. the line here, move the pole up and down. If you don't catch anything, you let it down a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Move the pole, and I have already a fish, so you just have to take it up. <laughs> Here you are. We need fish for the sea eagles later on. We're going to feed the sea eagles with the fish we catch. Only one. Or, you, only, only one. one. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> A lot of job. A lot of work to do. Like. <laughs> Everything happens. You're in the center, in the capital of fishing. <laughs> We are soon surrounded by a flock of gulls. They're apparently used to coming around for a handout. It's actually very hard to get them when they have the kids. They act, they are busy and, and like in the summertime there was a lot of fish in the sea and they hunt for themselves. They should do. They are wild and they should be wild. But we look skyward to catch sight of the first raptors. They circle for a good while, then dive down to catch the fish we've thrown out to them. We leave the Trollfjord just in time to see the sun setting on the Lofotens. During the summer, Solvayer is a sleepy port. But in winter, thousands of trawlers come from all over Norway to fish for scray, a type of cod that comes to the warm waters of the Lofotens to reproduce. So until next season, the few factories still operating finish off processing the stockfish, dried cod. Thank you. 
North of the Lofotens are the Westeralen Islands, where we meet Arild and Leila. They are Samis, once known as Laps, and they've chosen to return to the land of their ancestors. I feel something special for this area. Yeah, of course. Uh, it's like my home. <laughs> it's like uh, your flat in, a, in the town, and, and uh, another person's flat in the town, and this is my area. This is my, uh, my district, and I love it. It's a very important area for uh, the Sami people and the Sami culture always has been. And uh, if you look down here on the, those uh, rocks, we don't know what they are used to. Maybe to tame the animals in uh, this, um, in, in the start, it's, uh, they found a place here for a fire and that was uh, 1,000 years old. So um, I get um, goose skin when I <laughs> I'm passing this area. And it's it's a very important thing, foundings for um, for the Sami culture in this area. Some way of life is part of in eight different parts of the years. Um, we have eight seasons. Yeah, eight seasons. Norwegians have four. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and every season follows the reindeers. Yeah. You know, to be a reindeer owner is not just a work, it's a lifestyle. We have to follow the reindeers. They don't, they don't follow us. Because they do the same thing at the same time every year. Yeah. And they have done these things for thousands of years. If you start in the spring, all the calves, they are born in May, always. And um, in July and August, it's a very busy time for us, because then we have to go up to the mountains and live with the reindeers to earmark the newborn calves. And it's a lot of them. And uh, we had to go up there many times every summer. We are very privileged mm. um, to live this way. We are also very, very proud of uh, the way we are uh, taking care of the nature. Mm. We are living with the nature, in the nature, of the nature. And that's very important for us to, uh, to take care of it. At Harstad, we board our new boat, the Trollfjord, to continue our journey towards Tromsø, the capital of the north.
Throughout the 19th century, Tromsø served as the home base for all the polar expeditions to Spitsbergen and the Arctic. Those days are, of course, a thing of the past, but the adventures of the great explorers like Amundsen and Nansen are still very present in the Norwegian memory. During the stopover, passengers can visit the Polar Museum, and younger passengers, who may be less interested in history, can go to Polaria to watch the sea lions at play. Trollfjord leaves Tromsø at nightfall. We embark on the last part of our journey, which will take us to explore the northernmost part of Norway. For many passengers, the stopover in Hunningsvag is one of the highlights of the trip, as it is the gateway to North Cape. Our role and our work today are the same as they used to be. What's different is that before, Hurtigruten transported almost everything, fish and sea produce from northern Norway to the south, especially to Trondheim and Bergen. Fish processing has died out in certain regions, and methods have changed. This means the transportation of fish has sharply decreased as well. As for transport from the south to the north, things are pretty much as they always were. We ship fresh produce from the south of the country to the north. I think almost everybody go to North Cape directly because 
is the main attraction here. Everybody wants to see the northernmost point in Europe. So they just take the bus in the, in the bus station there and they go up uh, North Cape. I come from Madrid and there everything is crazy, pretty crowded the whole time with people around. And here it's just peaceful. It's like something you cannot pay with money at all. Ten years ago, there were 6,000 people here. In the winter, very strong. Most of them earned their living in the fishing industry. Today, there are only 3,000 of us, and a mere hundred live from fishing. So there are fewer and fewer of us. We're getting older, and the young people don't take up fishing. I live in Honigsvog. It's heaven on earth. Life is wonderful here. We have everything. I'm never sick, I never have a toothache, and I'll soon be 70 years old. We've entered the Barents Sea, heading for Kirkenes, the northern terminal for the Coastal Express Line. Kirkenes looks like a pioneer town. It sprang up in the middle of the tundra after iron deposits were discovered in the region. Those boom times are long gone. But far from being a handicap, the present poor economy seems like a blessing to the Norwegians who have chosen to live here. Kirkenes is a last frontier, a last land of opportunity. This is the statue showing the Red Army soldier who liberated uh, this area in 1944, October. And this was the first free part of Europe in the World War II. And as you can see, he is standing on, with his foot on a, a lump. And that lump used to be an eagle. And the eagle was representing the defeated Nazi Germany. So it's quite different than it should, it was meant to be. As we know, 
soon after the Russians became our enemies and Germany became our friends through NATO. And they decided that the eagle had to be removed. Times have changed and the Russians are now our friends again. And uh, someone wants to have the eagle back. And they think that it could be located here in Kirkenes somewhere, so it's almost like a little detective story. <laughs> We come here every weekend. In summer we fish some, in fall we gather berries and we hunt. Hunting season starts in September. We shoot snow partridge, then we have them for dinner. And back that way, three quarters of an hour away on foot, we have lakes full of fish. In summer we go camping there. That's what we do here. In winter we ride snowmobiles or ski in the area. And we hunt. It's a good life. It has been done for 60 years on this farm, yes. My father built this farm after the Second World War. Now I have 22 and I'm going to buy some more cows and for next year I have 25 to 27. All the milk for the cheese production come from my cows, yes. And they are only one hour old, this milk, when it go in the production. So it's a fantastic production, yes. In the winter time, the cows not go out, so we have to take care of, of grass from the fields and dry it up on the second floor. And, uh, and there, uh, there is uh, very good, it's very good food for for cows, for, uh, for the milk and for the cheese. We have so much light in the summertime. We have, uh, we have sun all day and all night, normally. Yes, and we load our batteries in that time. And yes, of course, and, and the use of it in November and December and January, yes. I'm not isolated here, I'm in the middle of the world, you know. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm in the middle of the world. It, it's uh, for, for um, the, uh, our town, it's only 40 minutes with, by car. 
Yes, and uh, and uh, and what else? To the airport is uh, is 40 minutes, and uh, it's another two two hours to Oslo, in the other end of Norway. It goes direct plane, direct from here to Oslo, and then I'm three four hours from Paris, I believe. It's in the middle of the world. <laughs> yes, <laughs> no problem. <laughs>